Hello and welcome, my friends and viewers, to this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from D&D 5th Edition, all while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we'll go over their origins within the game, how they utilize in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. This video we're going to be covering the druid, master of nature, commuter with the fae, and the best damn pet whisperer that the entire game has to offer. Druids have a 1d8 hit dice, proficiency in wisdom and intelligence saving throws, can use herbalism toolkits, and have a small pool of mostly bludgeoning weapons that they're able to use, including clubs, daggers, darts, javelins, maces, quarterstaffs, scimitars, sickles, slings, and spears. They can also choose to be proficient in two of the following skills, that being arcana, animal handling, insight, medicine, nature, perception, religion, and survival. Druids are also proficient with light and medium armor as well as shields, with the stipulation that they can only wear armor that has no metal on it. Whether or not this simply means that metal cannot touch the druid's skin, or if they cannot have metal in their presence at all, is up to the DM's discretion. At level 1, druids learn the secret language of druidic, which is a language that only they and other druids can speak and or read. They can use it to leave hidden messages, and non-druidic speakers require a DC 15 perception check to even see the messages left in druidic, but are unable to decipher them without the use of magic or the aid of another druid. Furthermore, druids also get spellcasting with wisdom as their spellcasting ability. As prepared spellcasters, they have the entire druid spell list to access, and can prepare a number of spells equal to their druid level plus their wisdom modifier. They may also cast certain spells as rituals, and use druidic focuses as their spellcasting focus, with their spell attack bonus being their wisdom modifier plus their proficiency bonus, and their spell save DC being that same number plus 8. At level 2, the druid gets access to the wild shape ability, allowing them to use an action to transform into any beast twice per short rest. As you level up, the level of challenge rating of the animal you can turn into increases. From level 2 to 3, you can only change it to non-flying and non-swimming beasts of CR 1 4th or lower. From level 4 to 7, you can change to non-flying creatures of CR 1 half or lower. And finally, from level 8 and beyond, you can transform into a CR 1 creature that can either fly or swim. You can stay on your wild shape for a number of hours equal to half your druid level rounded down, and may use a bonus action to revert back into your original form. You also turn back if you fall unconscious, fall to 0 HP, or die. Some of the stipulations that come with being in wild shape include the following. Your ability scores and stats are changed to that of the creature, though you retain your alignment, personality, and mental ability scores, as well as skill proficiencies and saving throws on top of the new ones that you get from your form. While in wild shape, you treat your form's HP as temporary hit points, and when you hit 0 HP in your animal form, you transform back into your original shape, but your normal HP is unaffected save for any damage that goes over that threshold. While in wild shape, you cannot cast spells, and the use of your hands or speech is restricted to that of your beast form. However, any spell that has been previously cast that has concentration is not broken by using wild shape. You also retain all racial abilities from your character's lineage, and choose whether your equipment falls to the ground in your space, merges with your new form, or is worn by your new form. Now instead of wild shape, you can choose the optional rule of having a wild companion. By spending a use of your wild shape, you can cast a spell find familiar without material components, summoning a fey that assumes the form of a beast from the spell's pre-selected list. This companion remains in your presence for a number of hours equal to half your druid level. And lastly, for second level, you get to choose your druidic circle subclass, choosing from the circle of dreams, the land, the moon, the shepherd, spores, stars, and wildfire. Whichever one you choose will inform the roleplay, labor, and mechanical role of your druid within the party, and you gain a new ability based on your circle at 6th, 10th, and 14th level. At level 4, like all other classes, druids get an ability score increase, choosing to gain plus 2 to 1 ability score, or plus 1 to 2 ability scores for a maximum of 20. Otherwise, you may choose a feat if the DM allows feats of their games, and druids gain access to this again at levels 8, 12, 16, and 19. Now, with the rest of druid being mainly focused on regaining spells and all of your subclass abilities, we'll jump all the way up to level 18, in which you gain access to timeless body and beast spells, the former allowing you to age only by one year every 10 years that pass, and the latter being able to perform somatic and verbal components of druidic spells while using wild shape. I do want to insert a little homebrew that I include in here, specifically for people who focus on wild shape or circle of the moon druids. The homebrew rule is that a wild shaped druid can cast spells while they're in their wild shape form, but the spell can only be a level equal to their proficiency bonus or lower. This way it prevents from getting a little too broken, but I have yet to experiment with it at higher levels. And finally, at level 20, you gain access to Arch Druid, where you can wild shape an unlimited number of times per day and ignore the verbal and somatic components of all your druidic spells, as well as any material components that have no cost and aren't consumed by the spell. This effect applies to spells that are cast both in your normal and your wild shaped form. Now, in terms of druidic subclasses, they can range from simply focusing on different environments within the material plane, to covering various aspects of reality, mythical creatures, and even different organisms. We'll start with the Circle of Dreams. The Circle of Dreams druid is a druid whose powers are born from the energies of the Feywild. Serving as a guardian of the good Fey and as a warden against the maligned Fey, their focus is on mending wounds, healing hearts, and using positive energies of the Fey courts and their dreamlike aspects to give the adventurers a good place to rest. 
This is, for lack of a better word, the mom friend druid, as mechanics-wise, the druids of the dream circle focus on healing the party as well as the manipulation of planar space itself, allowing you to teleport, scry, and even prevent the discovery of your party by your enemies. The Circle of the Land Druid is the more classic, tender to the land sort of druid, in which you choose an environment to align yourself with, the list being Arctic, Coast, Desert, Forest, Grassland, Mountain, Swamp, and even Underdark. Your choice of habitat gives you extra spells based on what you pick, and they don't count against your pre-selected spells, treating it as if you always have them prepared regardless of what you actually choose. The Land Druid also gains extra cantrips, can actively regain spell slots through meditation even if you're not in your specifically chosen environment, and eventually becomes naturally warded against poison, disease, or attacks and effects caused by both fey and elementals. This is personally one of my favorite druid exo classes due to its strength, versatility, and flavor for different habitats, and I would very much like to see Circle of the Land Druids flavored with extra planar spaces such as the upper or lower planes, or even the astral and ethereal planes. Tell me how you guys think that would go. The Circle of the Moon Druid is the druid that turns into various different animals to suit the needs of the party. While a druid can do that normally as a part of their base class features, the moon druid's entire focus is on the wild shape feature, able to consume their spell slots in order to heal themselves, and turning into beasts of higher challenge ratings before eventually becoming elementals and other non-beast type creatures. I like to portray these druids as always working hard to keep the balance between their mortal side and their animal side, some succumbing to the change permanently and living life as animals over normal people. The Circle of the Shepherd Druid is a subclass that focuses on summoning other creatures during combat, or what I like to call the Combat Clog Druid due to how quickly they could fill up the initiative order. The creatures that Shepherd Druids summon have higher hit points, stronger attacks, and they, as well as the party, can benefit from a number of auras that the Druid can summon, each of them being reflective of different animals. These are your Disney Princess Druids, the ones who call animals to aid them whenever needed. And while most players use these creatures only for combat, you could summon these creatures for all manner of different reasons such as retrieving objects, helping in construction, or even aiding in piloting a vessel such as a ship. Druids of the Circle of Spores focus less on the idea of living, breathing creatures and more on the beauty of decay and infestation. I sort of see them as a spiritual successor to the Vermin Lord from older editions, but with the transition over to fungi and other forms of decay. Mechanically, the Spores Druid can animate creatures with necrobotany, deal additional necrotic damage with their spores in various different ways, and eventually become immune to several conditions and ignore critical hits altogether. They are excellent for upfront combat and for dealing with large crowds of enemies, and is also again one of my favorite Druid subclasses. To be honest, I feel like I'm going to be saying that for everything, as the next one, the Circle of Stars Druid, is yet another personal favorite. In my opinion, it's one of the most versatile spellcasters in the game, capable of calling upon the power of space beyond the planet and the constellations themselves. Stars Druids get free casts of the spell Guiding Bolt, can use their constellations to give their allies and themselves beneficial effects, and can add bonuses to their allies' checks or penalties to the enemy checks that they make. Plus, the theme of space in Star Druids is always something that I very much love to explore. Lastly, the Circle of Wildfire Druid is again, another favorite of mine, and is a double dipping sort of subclass, able to add bonuses to either healing spells for their allies or damaging spells for their enemies. They channel the power of fire and destruction less as its own end, but more to make way for new life and new creations. Wildfire Druids get access to fire and healing spells, and can summon a wildfire spirit in lieu of a regular animal companion, and can effectively bounce between raining fire down upon your enemies, and healing, curing, or even reviving their allies using their class features, rather than just their base spells. It's all very interesting, but when it comes down to the flavor of the base class, Druids, in my opinion, serve as the people who have wholly thrown themselves into the arms of the world around them. They protect and nurture the land not just out of reverence, but because the land provides, protects, and in some cases is merciful in allowing them to continue to exist. As such, druids can draw upon the energy and physicality of the realm as well as people who are inhabiting it, which offers all manner of different roleplay opportunities for both the player and the DM to explore. I once had a circle of the land mountain druid struggle with being turned to stone the more he used his powers, and one moon druid ended the campaign by remaining a wolf for the rest of his days, having grown tired of the normal human world and wishing for a simpler life. I even explored disability with druids by having a player of mine play a blind druid of the circle of stars, the stars being the only thing that she could see due to the circumstances of her birth. There are many great things out there for you guys to explore, so don't count the druid out as one of those one-trick pony classes. Delving further into the mechanics, here are some great feats that I recommend you guys choose when building your druid over the course of your game. While charisma is not an ability that most druids tend to focus on, the actor feats effect to allow you to mimic the sounds of animals and other creatures can be very interesting to use and explore, such as using bird calls to signal to your party members or spooking enemy scouts by sounding like a wild wolf. Alerts bonus to initiative and allowing you to no longer be surprised, as well as observance bonuses to perception and investigation, are both really excellent ways to represent animal instincts and heighten senses of hearing and smell and such. Crusher is purely useful due to the druid's focus on using bludgeoning weapons, while Slasher, Piercer, Sentinel, Mage Slayer, and Mobile, and Grappler are all very excellent for those wild shaping moon druids or those combat focused spore druids who want to get all up in their enemies' grills. Resilient, tough, and durable are all great for upping your druid's staying power in combat, especially if you're wading through enemies as a wildfire, moon, or spores druid. 
And finally, Fae Touched and Eldritch Adept are great if you have a subclass that focuses on interacting with the Fae. The former granting you specialized movement with Misty Step and additional spells, and the latter giving you access to some flavorful Eldritch Invocations. Meanwhile, Elemental Adept's rerolling of 1s on damage rolls is also something that's very great for, say, the Wildfire Druid, whose attacks focus primarily on dealing one sort of damage, that being fire. And speaking of Wildfire Druids, this actually leads very well into a few PC and NPC concepts that I've created for you guys to use in your games. First off, we have Magus, a wildfire druid whose abilities are free skin to represent the fires of the lower plains rather than just traditional fire. Born from Asmodeus himself, Magus had an innate connection with the Nine Layers and its hellish flames, and thus uses them to burn and cleanse the material realm to make way for the rise of Asmodean influence. With Magus, I decided to try and depart from the conniving nobleman cultist that everyone likes to use when it comes to Asmodeus, in favor of shifting his approach from controlling the urban cities to the extensive forests where kingdoms get a lot of their resources. The cities may be a breeding ground for corruption, but the trees that they log, the ore that they mine, and the stone that they use to build their castles and keeps all come from beyond the city walls. Controlling the supply means controlling the demand, and Asmodeus would be very keen to send someone who understands that part of the world to rein it in for him. Magus carries a devilish cunning and charisma, but is not tied down by the laws of contracts and deals due to his innately chaotic nature as a druid. He's a great villain to throw your party for a loop if you're engaged in a plot focused on devilish conspiracy, and he's also a very great concept for an evil aligned PC as well. Next, we have Thelus, a reborn Spores Druid who, upon being killed and left for dead, was overgrown by a powerful fungus created by a wizard's experiments with necrobotany gone wrong. He awakened with a harsh breath, holding onto most of his memories and finding most of his body replaced with a sentient, self-sufficient fungal replacement. And now he seeks vengeance against those who wronged or killed him with the aid of this new terrifying fungal force that's reanimated him. Spores Druids have such excellent flavor, and the idea of a character dying and being brought back in this sort of Resident Evil-like sentient fungus is both terrifying and just absolutely juicy for roleplay and backstory purposes. You can draw upon the character's struggle to retain his own mind as he's being taken over by the fungus, or his presence innately spreads fungus all over the continent, leading to a massive Last of Us-style infection of the dead and dying. As an NPC, the party can find him and either try to free him from his fungal state, kill him if he seeks vengeance against one of them, or be met with a vicious spread of his fungus affecting villages and towns, and causing the dead to rise again. And thus they'll be called upon to find the source. And lastly, we have one of my favorite character concepts and someone I've actually used in one of my games, Ciri, a dark elf born with constellations dotting her skin as a natural call to the night sky and the moon above. Her backstory is an open one, either being raised on the surface by a druidic order, or having escaped the Underdark in order to see the sky after being entranced by its beauty. Studying the constellations and their meanings, Ciri has decided to forego the packs of traditional aberrant eldritch creatures that Dark Elves align themselves with, in favor of drawing upon the power from either the bright stars themselves, or the gods of stars and moons such as Saiyanine, Saloon, and the like. This is a great way to avoid the traditional overdone drow backstories of escaping the Underdark, in favor of doing something a little bit more unique and interesting. Ultimately, Ciri can serve as a good mentor for another druid character, or could even serve as a sort of oracle for them to consult, reading the stars and able to tell them where to go on their journey. When creating a druid character, you ultimately want them to be tied to the lands and the powers that they call upon to use them to guide their actions and to prompt the thought process of the character. Unlike the warlock, the druid's alliance with the natural world is often willing and deeply revered. So ask yourself these questions when making a druid character. Why does the druid provide protection for this land, and why this specific area? Who would attack the druid's land or circle, and for what reason? And why would this give the druid cause to adventure out of their chosen place of residence? And finally, what are ways that your druid's connection to the natural world can be tested, strengthened, or even questioned? All great stories are about struggle and the not meeting of expectations. And all of these will generate answers and great opportunities for roleplay, exploration, character growth, and often even provide ideas for boons, adventures, or even magic items. Speaking of which, our homebrew magic item for this video is the Druid's Knot, an item that requires attunement by a druid and grants the following abilities. The wearer of the knot gains access to the druidcraft and shaleidic cantrips, and has advantage on checks to see messages written in druidic. Additionally, every long rest, they may choose to either select one symbol from the knot, that being either the beast or the land. Upon selecting the beast symbol, the wearer has advantage on all checks made against creatures of the beast or monstrosity types, and has advantage on saves against being frightened. If they already have advantage on saves against being frightened, they instead become immune. If the wearer chooses the land symbol, the wearer has advantage on all checks made against creatures of the fae or plant types, and has advantage on saves against being charmed. Once again, if they already have advantage on saves against being charmed, they instead become immune. This is a good item for your druid to get a bit of a leg up when confronting monsters of various types, and trying to see if they can interact with them beyond just fighting them in combat. Likewise, it's good to stack with other buffs regarding the charmed or frightened conditions, and the druid needs to make the choice between the land or beast symbol at the start of the day thus forcing them to try and gather more information on what they encounter before making the choice. I've included the item stat block in the description below.
And that's the druid, everybody. I want to thank all of you guys for watching. And if you like the video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And please press the little bell icon to be notified of future videos. If you guys would like to vote on the next video, please follow the link in the description. This week it's going to be gods between Arathis, the Lawbearer, Celestian, the Far Wanderer, and Jurgal, the Scribe of the Dead. And also guys, let me know what kind of druid characters you guys have played in your games, what kind of druid NPCs or enemies have you guys encountered, and what strange and cool stuff you guys have done or experienced with the class. And also please, let me know what you guys would like to see in upcoming videos. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.